Hello, I'm Phil Jackson, and this is The Ruttles Are Here, a collection of interviews and stories from the band members and associates of the most infamous band in the world, The Ruttles. Who are The Ruttles, I hear you say? Well, you might have to go and find that out for yourself. This next hour of interview and chin-wagging is part one of Ken Thornton's story and life in the Rattles. Ken is one of the most amazing guitarists in the world, by my reckoning, anyway, and he has been the dedicated guitarist in the Rattles' live touring band since the moment they started in the early 2000s. We caught up to have a very laid-back chat not too long ago, And he told me about his whole story of when he first heard about the Ruttles and then eventually playing in the Ruttles. Here we go. Okay. So here I am with Ken. Ken Thornton. Ruttling Ken Thornton. What a wonderful face you have. (laughs) If only the (laughs) listeners could see it. (laughs) So uh, how are you doing, Ken? I don't want you to lose listeners. No, no, we're not going to lose listeners. So we won't show your face ever. But uh, <laughs> it was no. one time. I remember when I I met um, Mike Pato's um, surviving family. Um, they uh, Mike Pato's son said something about I was too ugly to tour. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? Jesus. Uh, uh, it was it was really fun to meet them all, but I, I'll never forget that. It's, it's kind of one of those things. I don't know. Mike, Mike was known for saying strange things to funny things. Like he would sign autographs, keep your bowels open, Mike Pato. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, it was funny. I would bring that up for once in a while to make Mike's brother, Phil laugh. Um, All right. So uh, yeah. So um, the beginning, where do we start with you and, and the Ruttles came 1978 like everybody else pretty much well yeah well yeah because it was um march of 78 is when they first showed the tv special here in the states and um yeah for i know it sounds silly but for me it was kind of like my ed sullivan show because i even at you know that age i was a big money python fan Huge Beatles fan because of my my aunt Karen who got me listening to Beatles when I was like four or five or something, and uh, uh, also a Saturday Night Live fan. So I saw this thing being advertised, and all these things combined. I was waiting all week to see it. And apparently, I was one of a small number of people because it was like the lowest rated TV show, primetime TV show for many years if if and maybe it still is i don't know but um uh anyway i i i loved it i went out right away and bought the um the album and the eight track cartridge i, I just played the heck out of them and I, I can still remember putting that album on and like right off the bat the first song was uh, hold my hand and you know the first lines of the you know and I'm not the kind of guy who likes to play Big Brother. But I've just seen your date outside. He's with another. I mean, it made me laugh straight away. So I was hooked, like, from the very first lines. And, um, I mean, just, I was an instant fan of the music. Um, but back then, obviously, there was no way to go back and watch the TV show, unless you were one of those people that were rich and had a VCR at the time. Um, so, really, I just played the the album over and over again. And it wasn't, I think, till like 83 or something where they released it on a, in a home video VHS tape. But, um, yeah, I played that album as much as any Beatles album, which to me, I think it says a lot. I mean, the, the songs were that good. And I also got into collecting all the memorabilia. Um, Derek Taylor was involved, and he commissioned them to create all sorts of badges and posters and postcards and cocktail napkins, all sorts of stuff. And I, I just, I had to collect, you know, matchboxes. I collected everything I could find in the Ruttles. And I guess I still do, although it's really hard to find anything that I don't have nowadays. Um, so that's really how it started. Yeah. 
Fantastic. And so, you, so through through then the eighties, you're you know obviously uh, starting to play. When were you starting to play guitar then? When did I start playing guitar? Yeah. Um, the year before seventy no seventy six. 76 is when I started playing guitar. I actually started playing drums. Mm. Um, I had a friend that lived down the street and they had a old set of orchestra drums. It was like, a, just like a three piece kit. Um, and I begged and begged until my father agreed to buy it. And uh, so I started teaching myself how to play drums, listening to, uh, Rush and Led Zeppelin records. And, um, and my brother got a guitar and um, he ended up getting frustrated with a guitar and, and his teacher was not very helpful either. He was kind of a jerk. So my brother yeah. chucked it in and I ended up getting the guitar too and started teaching myself how to play guitar. And uh, yeah, and I, and I remember it was 76 because there was an album out by a band called Boston at the time. And I can, I still can remember myself pretending to play guitar with a tennis racket in my bedroom along to a Boston album. So it was later that out that year that I got the guitar and there's recordings of me and my friend playing in 77. And um, I'm just playing basic bar chords and stuff, but we were writing our own songs even then. Um, it's kind of weird to think about that, but it was like 11 years old. Hmm trying to write songs. I have my first ever guitar solo on tape, which is absolutely hilarious. <clears throat> <laughs> Hilariously bad. Um, so you still got that? Oh yeah. I still got those <laughs> tapes from back then. Yeah. They're, they're pretty funny. Uh, but they're, some of them are actually quite good for, for considering that we'd only been playing a year, but um, most of it's just hilariously bad. Um, so yeah, that's when I started playing and, there was there were always pianos around that I'd, I'd tinker around with, but never had lessons. And pretty yeah. much taught on everything, and well, that's pretty yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, if people have heard your stuff, and that's pretty phenomenal stuff. It shows shows your natural ability and ways of working things out. Because you know you are. You know, yeah, I used, to, I used to spend hours doing that, putting on a like Jimi Hendrix record, trying to work out all the little riffs and little wing and stuff like that. I I'd, I'd spend hours and hours figuring out, well, how did he possibly play these things? And, and you'd figure it out if you worked hard enough, but those were the days before you had all the, the tablature magazines and YouTube, you didn't have the internet then. So you couldn't just go out to YouTube and find a hundred lessons on how to play yeah, sunshine of your love or whatever it is, you know, mm. like like you have today. Everything's so much easier to learn today. So could could you could you uh, play it on something and slow it down, or was it just literally? The only thing I had was I did have a turntable that had a a speed control on it, which was handy for his, some of the Hendrix stuff because he, um, on some of his stuff, he tuned down to E flat. So there was really no way to play along with it in standard tuning unless you could change the speed on it. Um, and then uh, it, at some point in the 80s, I had a, a four track where I could slow everything down. But um, no, in the early days, it was basically you just had a record player or a cassette tape or an eight track. And I just had to play it over and over again <clears throat> to figure things out by ear. Yeah, because I, I started more doing that right at the end of the 80s. So, uh, you know, I, I was just using tape and I had a uh, four track tape player and I could take the, and I could turn that down actually in speed. But I'd take that tape out and put it in a normal tape deck, whatever whatever it was, you know, it could be like a Jerry Lee type thing playing very fast. I'd put that in the tape deck and you know, by magic, you know, obviously, you know, technically you, you, you probably say, well, yes, it, of course it does that. But <laughs> I put it in the normal tape, tape deck <laughs> after having it on, on the recording onto the four track at normal speed, put it in the normal tape deck and it would slow it down, but it would slow it down uh, and it would still be in exactly the same key. So oh, it's, cool. And so it would be like, oh, I can still, but it's really, really slow, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I could hear the actual notes and I go, oh, that's what's being played. Okay. Well, we, um, yeah, we did well, we, we did what we had to do in those days. You know? Yeah, completely. Oh, yeah, totally. And, um, I mean, these days you've got people just doing videos on on YouTube, taking you through every step and everything all the time, aren't you? Crazy stuff. So, so you were playing and learning, and obviously you were, it sounded like you were playing and learning everything you liked. Um, so, obviously the Beatles were in there. And did you, at that age, were you, were you trying to play anything that was Rattles then as well? You know, I don't, I don't know. I, for whatever reason, even though the Beatles was was my favorite band and probably always will be, I didn't learn a lot of it, and I don't know if that was. It's not a. It's like it's not a conscious thing where I can go say, yeah, it, you know, I didn't want to demystify it or anything by learning all the songs. I didn't want to be listening to a Beatles song and saying, oh, that's an A minor chord. Or this, I, remember, I know how you play this riff and have that stuff going through my mind rather than just taking in the music. Um, I don't know if that happens with you, like when you're listening to something, yeah. especially something you've learned how to play and, you, and you're thinking about playing it or yeah. what chords they are rather than just taking it in and, and, and enjoying it for what it is. Totally, yeah, well, I, I had the same experience with Queen. That was my thing and, and I could if I needed to, but... Even to, to today, you know, I still don't know how to play a lot of Queen stuff because that's exactly the way I was. I was I was a fanatic of Queen, and then and then I got into the Beatles more and stuff like that. But didn't learn and play a lot of Queen stuff necessarily. I know a few mm-hmm. of their, a few of their tunes, but but obviously subsequently you you know doing doing gigs and everything, you became an aficionado of a lot of Beatles and Rattles. And yeah, that came. Yeah, that did, did, did come a lot later. Well, one of the first songs I really tried to learn how to play ever was blackbird and we and it's when i was in elementary school there was a a girl named bobby who could play guitar and sing songs she'd sing songs like um get together by the young bloods and blackbird and i was really just impressed that somebody could sing and play guitar and stuff even at that age and, and it really inspired me to want to play more and so that was one of the first songs i wanted to learn Mm. It was Blackbird, and I'd learn how to figure out how to do riffs like Day Tripper and and things like that. But no, I I didn't really learn a lot of the Beatles stuff, and I, I can't tell you why. But um, but yeah, and I got into that trio several years ago, Sergeant Eggman, where that was the focus. We were playing mostly Beatles stuff, and suddenly I was learning all these things and learning a lot of the solos and the chord progressions and harmonies and that. So, but you know, I I find it didn't really affect it as much as I thought it might. Like I can still, I listen to the songs and I just can still enjoy them. Like I always did. I don't find myself having my mind all cluttered with, Oh, that's this chord or that chord or, you know, there's some of that, but it's, it, it didn't affect things. You met Neil with the uh, the Beatle Fest stuff, and yeah, that, that had been going on for some years. The Beatle Fest, and yeah, that, since like the mid seventies, I think yeah. it was the fir- first one was like seventy four, seventy five, something like that. Yeah, and when, when when were you going to them? Oh, I didn't even know about them until like the later eighties. I moved down to where I live now and and met some other Beatle maniacs, I guess we'll call them, uh, people that were I mean, really into be- heavily into Beatles music and knew all the outtakes and the, the bootleg stuff. And they told me about it. And so I went to a few. And then when I found out Neil was going to be at one, of course I had to go to that. And I actually, that was the first one where I actually went up and stayed the whole weekend. And that was in ni- 1994. I just couldn't believe it. It's like, you know, I got, he was such a pro. Uh, a um, an entertainer he'd do sets by himself in the afternoon and he played with the house band Liverpool at night but he would it was the first time I got to see him do things like protest song and love is getting deeper they the, the silly French version and yeah. uh, slaves of freedom and he I mean he really got the audience involved sure yeah like, you know, a lot of the songs were like you know he he he'd pull you in so he just you know it's no wonder why he became one of the favorite guests at the, yeah. those Beatle fests. And, um, 
so I got to meet him and talk to him some. And was it, was that your introduction to to Neil's solo stuff, or were you had you found all that before? No, I I had his albums, or his main albums. It didn't have everything, but I had like Taking Off and Innis Booker Records and Rutland Weekend Television. Um, I don't think I had off the record at that point, and I didn't have some of the singles at that point. I had, I had um, How Sweet to Be an Idiot, of course. That was my favorite solo record. Mm. So, I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't know as much as I know now, like about all of his other projects he was working on. I didn't, I don't think I knew about Grimm's yet at that point. And I hadn't seen Venus Book of Records television series at all at that point, but um that all came soon after but yeah it was it was great and i still have um <laughs> i have some pictures from that time when i first met him and that uh, and um i don't know why but the pictures that i took with him i'm always making silly faces <laughs> it's, like, it's just totally not like me it's i always you know just you know whenever i get a chance to have a picture with somebody like that i just it'd be just normal smiling but <laughs> i'm like i'm always making a goofy ass face with Neil. I don't know. I guess that just says something about how at ease I felt with him just hanging out with them immediately. I say hanging out, but I mean, it was mainly just waiting in line to get autographs and having a, a, a few minutes just to talk with them. That's really what it was the extent of it back at that point. So yeah, that was amazing. He autographed some of my stuff and I don't know, there's that's, that's basically what happened that first time. Yeah. Um, but what was nothing that was really cool about that trip that I learned later about for him was that he had no idea there were so many Ruddles fans. For him, it was just this project that he did in the 70s. And, you know, that was a one off thing. And he had no idea that were a whole bunch of us still listening to that album and playing the heck out of it. So that was an eye opener for him. And, I, and that indirectly led to them doing the archaeology album a couple of years later, because it's like, well, maybe, you know, like George Harrison said, no, okay, it is, it is part of the soup. There are a lot of Beatle fans that are also Ruddles fans. So I don't I wonder if he hadn't come to Beatle Fest in 94, if he would have done it. He seemed to put everything into the album, I, you know, as far as I can tell. He's, um, yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. He certainly did. Maybe too much into it. Spent every cent he possibly could have spent on making that album as good as he possibly could have made it. Yeah, I know, I know John John has always said it was the best thing he was ever on. So, Yeah, it's a fantastic album. It's better than the first in many ways, I think. But, mm. I mean, the first, the first album is it's hard to beat things like with A Girl Like You and Ouch and Piggy in the Middle. I mean, but those, the second album is a lot, it's, it's a lot more like Neil songs, but kind of given a Ruddles treatment as opposed to things that are closely um, derived from the original Beatles songs. Yeah. Things like Joe Public, you know, it's, mm. I think Joe, Joe Public is fantastic, but it's not really anything like any Beatles song in, 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 except for that the, the drum pattern is a bit like Tomorrow Never Knows. Yeah. So, so we go from 94 and you, and you start becoming uh, a regular at the Beatle Fest, do you? Or? Oh, at the Fest? I don't know. I, I'd go whenever there were um, people I was particularly interested in, in no. seeing. You know, like if they'd have somebody like Klaus Warman or somebody go. I yeah. didn't go every time. Okay. Would, would Neil be doing shows that then you, that you'd see? You'd... Well, the, the next time I saw Neil was three years later. The, the year after Archaeology came out, um, Neil... Ricky and John came back to the fests or they, they, I shouldn't say came back. They came to the, the Beatle Fest and they did some stuff as the Ruddles. Yeah, that, <laughs> that was just, I mean, that was just so cool to see them playing together. And um, th they only played in the evening with, uh, with Liverpool and they did like, I think four or five songs each night. And um, uh, John was having a, a ball you could tell, I mean, he, he was, uh, you know, blowing real bits of fluff into the air out of his hand, you know, during rendezvous and he's dancing around the stage. Ricky sang Joe public. I remember. And there was one particularly funny moment on the last night they were doing cheese and onions every night. Of course they did cheese and onions. And then 
they decided to end the uh, the last set with Shangri La. So they started doing that, and then Neil starts singing the words to "Cheese and Onions." <laughs> Because the keys are the same and the chords are pretty close, but um, it, he went on. He got, I think, he got all the way through singing "Cheese and Onions" before he realized that no, everyone else had stopped playing, and and uh, just the reaction and the laughter when when he realized what he had done was it was so good. I have a video of that somewhere. Exactly. Um, but it was so so cool that i i actually flew out to los angeles later in the year back then they had the they also had a fest in los angeles but that's the first time i'd ever flown anywhere to see a band john well neil and john at least knew who i was at that point and so i you know i got to spend a little more time with them in la actually and john and i had been talking a little bit about pato uh, the band he was in with ali halsell Mm -hmm. in the early 70s uh, the, after the, after the fest was over, we met for breakfast uh, on that Monday, and I, I don't know. We must have talked for an hour, hour and a half or so about all this Pato stuff. It was great. I got to ask him all these questions. He told me all these hilarious stories um, until Neil came and dragged him away to go see Eric Idle. <laughs> so I remember I don't drink coffee, as you probably you probably remember. I wasn't a tea person, but I. Because he was drinking coffee, I drank coffee, and, and I must have had like six or seven cups. And by the end of the discussion, I was vibrating. I was like shaking from all the caffeine. Um, I remember I went on, what was another thing that happened that was funny? Um, oh, yeah, I remember John, John flew in kind of late on the Friday night, and he showed up um, kind of jet lagged and but he had to play and I remember them doing like a um, reggae version of cheese and onions that first night. I'll have to look and see if I've got, I think I've videotaped that too, but that was pretty funny. But yeah, it was, it was, it was good. One of the fun things about those Beatle Fest, they did like a fake press conference at each one in character and they were so funny. I mean, and you know how, especially how John is, he's yeah. just always doing these crazy, funny things. Yeah. Um, but were, they had, were, were they dressed they, up? No, they didn't dress up, but they just, you know, they did them as Ron, Barry, and Stig. And they were interviewed as though, you know, in character. So there's just the Neil and John just had so many funny responses to all the questions that came up from Martin Lewis and from the, just the us fans in the audience. So good. And you can find some of those on YouTube, I think, but they're, they're definitely worth looking out, looking for because they're funny. I think that was really the time where they knew better who I was. And um, I started having more conversations with John on the phone about the Pato stuff because I wanted to make a website. And yeah, I started becoming good friends with John through that. And so, so at this point, had you had you sort of had that conversation with Neil saying, if you want a guitarist, had you had Not, that? Well, that came a little bit later. And that's, yeah. So in, in, it was in 2000, I went over on a trip to England with, with one of the main purposes was to take John to the to the library so he could see the Pato website. Cause he didn't have the internet yet at that point right. <laughs> at home. So I, that was one of the, the things was, was the purposes of that trip was to go and, and show him the website. So we did that and he let me look through his archives and got to see his pub and why wow, I mean, that trip was just mind blowing. But, and I had arranged to meet Neil in Liverpool during that trip. I was going to meet him after his show and, and buy him a drink. That's when that happened. Um, instead of it being just at the venue, uh, it ended up being uh, Neil, Yvonne, uh, and I sitting in this, the the Delphi, you know, the, the Delphi Hotel. Yeah. It's a big, huge ballroom there. And it ended up being just the three of us alone in this ballroom. And I got to ask him all these questions I'd been wanting to ask him, including some things that he thought were amusing. Like the like I asked him, well, what the heck's a caravan site? You know, it's like, what is that? You know, it didn't mean, to me, the only caravan I knew of was camel you know like guys with camels in the desert you know heading to the next oasis or whatever i didn't know what he's talking about 
so he basically explained that it's it's basically what we call a trailer park here. A car- I didn't know what a caravan was. So anyway, he thought that was funny. And yeah, and I ha- and yeah, Phil, I have no idea where this came from. I still can't believe I said it, but I'm obviously glad I did. I said something about yeah, if you're ever touring in the U.S. and you need a, I know a guitar player that would do it pretty much just for nothing, for just for the fun of it. And he, you know, he said something like, uh, well, would that guitarist be anywhere within a five foot radius of me right now? Or something like that. <laughs> and I still have, I have no idea where I got the nerve to even, you know, throw that out there. It was crazy to think about it. But um, I was going to say, you don't, especially that moment, you weren't thinking to yourself, oh, well, I'm a great guitar player or. Oh, no. Or anything like that. No, I, I knew I was, I was capable enough where I could play, but I, I didn't think that anything was going to happen. I don't know. I have no idea. I really have no idea where that came from, but it just goes to show, you know, sometimes if you just throw something out there and, you know, things can happen and change your life. I mean, that was, I mean, just crazy to think about that. But um, I was telling you, I was telling you about my hotel that I had in London that I was going back to. It's one of those, I went, I was on a tight budget for that trip. And I was telling him that this place I was staying, it's one of those places where you don't even want to walk on the carpet and bare feet, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty nasty place. So he said, well, why don't you come and stay with us for a night? And I just, you know, I was like, I can't believe my luck. <laughs> what is yeah. going on here? I was just, it was, I, I, I wasn't even sure if he was serious, but he was. So yeah, I I got to to go spend a night over with Neil and Yvonne and their places. I don't know, were you ever over there when they were in Farnham? Yeah, yeah, I went over there a bunch of times. Yeah, out in the sticks, out in the countryside, not far from uh, well, Ipswich, the town. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, I figured. I just can't remember us ever being there together anyway. But um, yeah, it's a lovely home, and Yvonne's gardens were were beautiful and. I remember spotting the horn resounding from the Eric the Viking film out in the garden. It's like, <laughs> yeah. of course, I had to take pictures with that. And and he had, you know, some really cool things around the house, like his How Sweet to Be an Idiot promo poster, his Ruddles record award. And I got to, to check out his Bonzo's Gretsch guitar. And um, I don't know, did you, did you ever see those big platform shoes he had that he used for... Um, like band wet or I, he used them with Monty Python and probably with Grimm's, but you, know, you dress up, dress up kind of like a glam rock guy on these. Yeah. Well, I almost killed just, myself on those. <laughs> <laughs> They're really hard to walk in. I'll tell you. Are you talking about the really, the really tall ones? The yeah. Sp- well, the they were like, well, they were probably like a foot tall. Yeah. The, 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 he did a, he did a sketch with that. The new where he just did the blues song. Is that the one? It could have been short blues, yeah. With I think he did like a Python TV appearance where he did the, he was wearing those to play short blues. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did see them, and uh, I think I saw some of the some of the guitars. And I remember um, again, I was there with the Jay, who you know played bass with us, mm-hmm. and um, he, he was getting out his guitars because I, I can't remember why he was just getting out his guitars. I go, here's some guitars, <laughs> and. Um, and he got out the uh, the bass that he had, the Ruttles bass. It was played on all the Ruttles stuff, and I think he had it since the sixties. So it's probably played on some Bonzo things as well. The, the, the Gibson kind of violin shaped one. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, and we we were saying, well, he might have pro- probably recorded um, Urban Spaceman on this as well. And then, but he got that out as well to show Jay, and then Jay ended up. It was like, well. You know, take it away, have a play on it. And it's like this guitar <laughs> that's like at least at least ten grand or something. And Jay's like, What? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a play with it and then he did did some of the tour with it, I think. But yeah, so I I remember a little bit of that. <laughs> that's that's the way Neil was, but and and that's that's actually what that's what happened. We after we had um, supper, he um he got a couple of acoustic guitars out. And we just started playing, um, drinking wine and playing guitars. And we played Ruddle stuff and Bonzo stuff and solo stuff. And and he uh, he started throwing out some songs that he hadn't even recorded yet. 
mm. that I had never heard. And, and I managed to follow along with those and throw some things in. And that, that went on for two or three hours. Sure. Just, we just kept playing and, and we got excited talking about Ollie's guitar playing. So he threw on some songs from the How Sweet to Be an Idiot album and we played along with those. And yeah, I just couldn't believe it. It just, uh, the whole thing just was blowing my mind. <laughs> like, well, how did I get here, you know? And I could say none of that was planned for the trip. I was just going to be buying him a drink and talking with him for a little while after his, after his gig in Liverpool. And then they, um, they showed me where I was going to be sleeping. And Amy Mann had stayed there just the week before. And there was this rack of clothing in there with his ruddle suit and all the stage costumes. And it's just like, <laughs> I don't know, they were, they were just really so nice to me. It was just, you know, I don't know how in the world I got there. And the, the thing that was before he took me back to the train station in Ipswich, he, um, he said, I don't know where or when Ken, but someday we'll be playing on stage together. You know, I just, I couldn't take it seriously. He's like, yeah, well, sure. <laughs> But it actually, and it did actually happen. Like the next year, we played um, for the first time at that same Beatle Fest that we met at in Chicago. And it was unreal. It was so fun. But, um, you know, obviously I was also kind of scared shitless, you know. <laughs> it's like, uh, it, it, was, it was something. Um, we played uh, solo stuff and Ruddle stuff, acoustic, just acoustic duos during the afternoons. I didn't, ha I didn't play at night like with the Liverpool band doing the uh, the electric Ruddle stuff at that <clears throat> that point. Um, uh, but that was such a that was such a good time because um, seeing them seeing him play the stuff with with Liverpool was amazing that whole that ballroom was packed full of people and it was electric yeah. in there uh, everybody was just so into it and um i met a, a whole bunch of new friends uh, that weekend uh you've probably heard about Bonnie and Lori um they were running a website about neil's songs and everything related to neil ken simpson i met that weekend uh, just a whole a whole bunch of us fans um, got to know each other, and I remember one one thing that was particularly fun was we had a sing along one night. We after at one night after the fest was done, we we got together with Neil over by one of the bars, and we drank a lot. And we I there was a guitar there, so I pulled it out and I started playing a bunch of Neil songs. And this group of people, all these big Neil fans knew all these songs that were, you know, for most people would probably say they were obscure, but I'd start playing Kenny and Lisa and Neil would sing and we'd all sing the harmonies and the choruses mm. loudly. <laughs> and uh, it was just an amazing moment um, because we were having a ball. You know, I'd, I'd play like, what do you do from Canesham or something? And all of us would be singing along. And uh, you could tell that he was having as much fun as we were. It must have been something special for him to have this group of people, you know, knew his songs and were singing them in his face really loudly, maybe, you know, a bit drunk, but um, it was just such a good, you know, good time. So I'll never forget that. That was in August of 2001. And although there was there was there was a Ruddles gig of sorts in 2000, they did one show. In, it was in London, and it was all Ruddles stuff. But he had some special guests singing some of the songs. Um, so the first, I don't. I guess I, I guess that's probably the first real Ruddles gig. But the first ones that that were done where Neil and John sang everything were the two that we did in 2001. It was called the unrugged tour. <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I did get invited to come over and play for that. And it, it was weird cause it was a, that was a month after nine 11. So I was a bit nervous to travel over and, and but my wife and I made the trip and, uh, we stayed at Neil and Vaughn's and, but leading up to that, it was, it was kind of funny. 
one of the things that happened with Neil, I was talking to Neil and he says, oh, well, I need a publicity photo for you. Well, <laughs> it wasn't like I had this long music career where I had publicity photos, you know? So I gave it some thought and I, um, I sent him my first ever publicity photo where I'm probably like six months old. <laughs> so it's like my first actual, you know, baby photo taken in a, taken in a photo studio. So I sent him that and, and he thought that was hilarious. So he used that. Uh, unfortunately for John and some of the other guys in the band, it, it, it gave Neil the idea to put silly photos in the program for them as well. <laughs> so John's photo is like some old guy with a, a, a kind of walking stick or something. And the horn players from uh, Jules Holland's band, um, they were a couple of cows <laughs> in a, out in a pasture. So I don't know if they, if they appreciated that, but um, Neil had fun with it. And um, so we did a couple of gigs. It was in Cambridge and Ipswich and the core of that, band is actually what went on to be the the touring version of the band so you had uh, you had griff uh mark griffiths on bass and mickey simmons on keys uh neil john and me and we also had uh, a great guitarist and great singer named steve simpson on those first shows but um those gigs were were uh, we played mostly ruddles uh, we played um, a bunch of Neil's newer solo songs and we played like Stoned on Rock, um, which was a Innis Book of Records era song. And we did, we opened the shows with Urban Spaceman where uh, he was just playing on acoustic, but the rest of us sang like the uh, recorder parts. I shouldn't say sang. We played the recorder parts, but we all played it on kazoos. Right. So that was kind of you know, a fun way to start the gigs. Um, and one of my favorite memories from that was, uh, well, during rendezvous, um, John had constructed this dandelion den, uh, uh out of like cardboard and what it was is in that, that those couple of bars between major happy and rendezvous, he had this string rigged up. So he pulled the string and up would pop this dandelion den in front of his bass drum. <laughs> it, was, it was so funny. Um, so um, that was great. And uh, and I, 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 I'd kind of forgotten about this, but I, I, I just, I remembered that the, uh, the whole thing with me playing drums on 64 went all the way back to those first gigs even. So, you know, John could get out front and do a paper tearing solo. Um, yeah, I had some, I have some pictures from rehearsals where I'm, you know, behind the kit and I'd kind of forgotten about that. Um, so these some, are, there's a video of one of those shows, like the entire show. I think Ken Simpson is the one that took that. So I have to go back and look at those again. I haven't seen them for a long time. These are the very, the very first shows. Well, I, I kind of consider them to be the first shows because it was the first time where we played, it was, we played all the Rottle stuff, but there were no special guests like Neil and John sang all their songs. So I don't know. I guess that, that when they did in 2000 was a Ruddle show. When I first heard about it, I thought it was, it was, it was only partly Ruddle stuff, but it, I think it was um, all Ruddles, but they just had like Nigel Planer and other people, um, they came and did guest vocals, kind of like when we did those Bonzos and Ruddle shows yeah. together. When they had, you know, we had some other people come up and sing the the Vivian Stanchel parts. You know, it was kind of like that. So staying at that that point, when did you really start learning Ruddle's tunes? Was it literally that moment because you had to? Well, I I learned. Before, obviously, I knew some of it before I went to visit him in 2000. Yeah. We, we played a bunch of it, uh, I guess the more well-known ones from the first album. Um, I didn't know any of the archaeology songs at that point. But yeah, when, when, I, when I found out that we were going to actually do a Ruddles thing, a Ruddles gig, um, 
I went about learning all the songs and it, it all came pretty quickly because there were some archaeology ones that I had to spend more time on because um, they hadn't been quite as in, embedded in my head. <laughs> but all the original Ruddle stuff, I mean, it, I, I almost didn't even need to listen to the records to figure out the parts. But I, I mean, I obviously did on some things like there were some riffs and um, it's looking good that I wasn't quite sure about. So I went back and listened carefully. But yeah, it was pretty much then. Yeah, and I know, I know your guitar playing is self-taught, yeah? But you obviously, you know, you, you taught yourself very well because I remember you sh you sending me some stuff when I was starting out and, you know, you'd written out some some parts with, you know, musical notation and stuff like that. And and, and I, I would have expected you to have learned, you know, learned that from, from some school. Yeah, so... Well, when I was in school, um, I was always in choirs. Okay. And and I did, I think at some point I took like a basic music theory course, but I would, everything I learned um, at school, I would take home and apply to the guitar. And I could figure out, okay, where the notes are. And, and when I say I'm self-taught, I, I mean, there were a few lessons. When I first started out, um, I had a Mel Bay guitar method book and I took a few lessons because that was part of the condition my dad said I can have a guitar if I take some lessons and mm. that's you know the that was the stage where it's like okay play camp town races on two strings <laughs> you know and and it, it became clear to me even then that my guitar teacher was spending more time looking at his fingernail and I don't know, dreaming about a manicure or something than paying attention to what I was doing. I would intentionally play wrong notes and he'd say, okay, go on to the next one. That was great. So I told my dad and I said, this is a waste of time. You know, I, I can teach myself better than this. So, and I did have a few lessons when I was in high school with one guy just to learn some technique. He showed me some finger exercises and things, but yeah, as far as chords and theory and all that, it was, it was from, I'd get a, maybe I'd get a song book by a band or something and it would have, you know, the ones where they have the bar chord or the chord charts above the melody that it, it wasn't really, they weren't, those books weren't meant for guitarists, but they would usually put some rudimentary chord charts above that you could play. They were never the right versions of those chords, but I'd, I'd learn bar chords that way. I had never seen a bar chord until I looked in, I think it was a kiss music book. It's like, Oh, what's that? And it was, I could see, oh, that's just basically an E chord being moved up and down the neck. And, and so I just, you know, I would see the patterns and, and I started teaching myself scales and modes and all that stuff. And most of it was just figuring it out, but mm -hmm. I did have, I did have a little help, um, along the way. Um, and of course you'd meet other guitar players that, that would say, oh, I know how to play this, this thing, you know, <laughs> here's how you play that crazy chord in purple haze you know so it was you know i guess it was kind of like you know you hear those stories about the beatles getting on a bus to go across town because there was a guy there that knew how to play a b7 chord you know <laughs> there was some of that going on we'd oh. share we'd share knowledge with other, you know between us these you know the musicians um, um, that's great that's great man it just sounds like you're you know you took the bull by the horn and you and uh you know, you progressed beyond uh, how anyone is going to teach you. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to do. I, I, I don't. I won't say I was inseparable from my guitar, but I was always trying to play, always trying to learn on the drums and guitar. I was always trying to to absorb stuff, and I always want. You know, I had this thing. I, I wanted to be able to play this David Gilmore solo, or I want to be able to play Little Wing by Jimi Hendrix, or whatever. And I would just I'd figure it out. And I, I just, you know, at that point I just had a ball playing along with records, you know, I just crank up my stereo, <laughs> crank up my amp and play along with it, you know, and I had fun. That's kind of what I did in it before I was really at a, an age where I could start playing in bands. Yeah. When, when was your first band? Well, I don't know. I guess you could almost say that band that I had with my best friend was my first band. We were called the TNR Climax Band. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> 
It was because his name was Rand. His last name was, his surname was Rand. And so it was Thornton and Rand, TNR Climax Band. <laughs> and I, I think at one point we call ourselves Dark Realm, which is kind of spinal tapish. But, it, you know, we, we, we weren't that, we weren't good, but we were determined. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can remember sometimes the neighbors telling us to stop playing because... <laughs> But we got better, you know, and we started playing as a three piece with a bass player. And we were, uh, I can't even remember what we called ourselves then. That's weird. Like, that's one thing that's one thing I've, I've kind of lost is whatever we were calling ourselves. But we didn't have a singer. We just played all these songs instrumentally and we'd go play at, play at kegger parties, you know, underage drinking with a keg of beer. And we'd just get pissed and play all these songs. <laughs> It'd be everything from Rod Zeppelin to ACDC, whatever, but we just played the music. Yeah. Didn't sing it. It's kind of a weird thing to think about now. And then I got involved with some friends mm. um, in the, about 80 uh, that were really into kind of um, more unusual music. Like they were listening to Mahavishnu Orchestra and King Crimson and that's when I started getting into stuff that was more challenging, lots of weird time signatures. Mm. Uh, you know, I guess you could say that was like the progressive rock stuff or the fusion, early fusion rock stuff that was going on. Yeah. And we'd play songs that had, you know, like the time signatures, time signatures would change every three bars. And it was just bizarre stuff. And I found that I kind of had a knack for that too. So um, later on, I was in a, really fun progressive rock band called Von Frickel. Yeah. And that was, that was a very creative, you know, really talented band, very challenging. And I had a, I had a blast with them. Um, anyway, I, I kind of forgot what we were talking about now. Well, <laughs> I, was, I was going back to uh, the actual, the idea of, of playing these oh you know, yeah you say you asked my first band was yeah and going, and going and sort of going back to uh, how you got to that point of playing the way you do and uh then getting to these songs that you were big big fan of that you know you you in some way probably avoided because you didn't need to play them and and you just enjoyed them and now you're playing these songs and learning all of them at the yep. same time and, and getting going and uh, whilst while still probably th thinking to yourself what am I doing here and uh, uh, you know do, do they really want me to play and uh, and, uh, and you're just ha happy that it's happening maybe once or twice and then you know you, you start going well it's not changing I'm going to you know they keep asking me to play and I keep playing and <laughs> oh yeah but there were there were a number of times with the Ruddles where we had, we went through some changes and I'm like, well, if we're changing that, why am I still being flown over from the States to play? You know, I, I, I don't know. I think it probably just came down to the, I mean, Neil especially knew how much I really loved the music and that I, I guess, you know, I was reliable. Um, but you can, you can play, but, you can play all the parts, man. You 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 know, you're, extremely good player and you, you're very solid and you know someone of your caliber is, is actually quite hard to find that isn't going to be really expensive and be some well-known guitarist so it's like it's it's like wow i've got this guy who, who can really fly and uh and he says he'll do it for free if you know <laughs> if he wants to you know? <laughs> we 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 kind of did some of those those like those early shows like those first Ruddle shows were actually um, financially, I, I that one was definitely out of pocket kind of thing. I paid for my own flights, of course, and Neil and Yvonne let Deb and I stay at their place, so we didn't have to worry about hotels and stuff. But that was that was really that was for the fun of it. Mm. That, that was and and no with no idea of getting paid or anything. You didn't care. Mm. It was it was all for the the fun of doing it, and unfortunately, um, for whatever reason, they it it ended up not being um, very successful from a financial standpoint. Yeah. So I think you know there was there was some money lost there, and 
that could have been the end of the Ruddles at that point. Mm. It could have been the the end of it, but <clears throat> thankfully it wasn't. We had some better opportunities come along later on, and we started playing more regularly. And so for the next four years, um, we did a number of gigs and did some tours. And, um, those early tours were they were really lean ones, very very tight budget. Um, <clears throat> and we didn't have people helping out. We didn't have managers. Um, Neil and John booked all the gigs, booked the hotels. We, uh, we shared hotel rooms. We didn't have any crew. So the band had to do all the driving, uh, all the unloading of the gear, setting it up, doing the gigs, tearing it down, loading it back in the van, mm. um, everything and then john also was the one who generally got the merch made he's the one who got the t-shirts and the mugs and the stickers and things and um those those yeah those early days were without any promise of walking away with with like some money or anything to show for it yeah it's a lot of work uh, but the gigs were were so fun it made it worthwhile um but so from the very beginning, it was it was all about having fun, as much fun as we could possibly have and trying not to lose any money. Um, the money wasn't really I mean, obviously, we, it'd be nice to walk away with something, but um, that wasn't the point. And um, uh, eventually we got a guy named Jim Driver to book gigs for us. I'm sure that was a very welcome thing for, for Neil and John. One less thing they had to worry about. But um, it wasn't until we started touring again many years later yeah, <clears throat> that we had a crew. Like uh, we'd have a regular front of house and guy and a backline guy. And we had a, a manager. Uh, mm. So the band didn't have to do all the driving and all that. Mm. Uh, it made it so much better. It was, I mean, it wasn't like a cushy thing where you had guitar techs and you just had basically had to waltz on the stage when it was time to do sound check. You know, you still had, <laughs> you know, you were there. Um, but yeah, those, those early days were, it's a lot of work. Um, and, uh, but it was just so much fun. It didn't matter. Um, Sure. Another, thing I, another thing I really remember from the early days of playing was um, uh, John was, as you know, is the one who's most likely to unexpectedly do something or, or, or say something funny, you know? Yeah. And he had, he had some elaborate gags, but it could be something as simple as pulling a face mm. or, or um, doing a crazy drum fill or, or ending a song with a like a barely audible tap on a little splash symbol <laughs> instead of a big huge crash that most people would do is <laughs> it was kind of almost dangerous to be in a band with him in the earlier days you know for me because he just made me laugh all the time every time I'd look back and we'd make eye, eye contact he'd make some silly face or he'd do something funny and I'd forget what chord I was supposed to be playing sometimes um so yeah, there were some times where I had to tell myself, okay, don't just don't look back there. Don't look back. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, but no, he was yeah. John was always like the kind of um spontaneous you never knew quite what was gonna happen mm. factor in the band. Yeah. And you know that too. You were oh, he, yeah. he was, oh, he's always been that way. Well, you know, was, yeah, he, he brought those he brought the fun always brought the fun element into it, no matter what the gig was, that's for sure. There's one that I remembered last night was um, we were doing uh, a gig somewhere and I, I looked and it was, we were doing piggy in the middle and, you know, I had the piggy masks and, you know, we'd wear piggy masks or some of us would. And I remember looking over at Mickey and he was just, he was laughing hysterically and, and that was not unusual for him. You know, yeah. sometimes it was just somebody made a mistake and he would, you know, he would just, laugh for a while but I, it, it wasn't until i turned around like halfway through the song and i saw john had this like instead of a piggy mask on he had a monster mask I did the monster, yeah yeah and I, so <laughs> you just you just never knew well what sort of shows were you doing at that at that moment what sort of size and what sort of thing because that was a brand new thing to people wasn't it 
Yeah, it was it was mostly um, clubs, which were my favorite ones anyway, where the audience is like right in your face. Uh, but we had small theaters, but we'd also do some like in you know London or in uh, we do the Hundred Club in London a lot, and we played like the like Philharmonic in Liverpool. We did some big ones, um, uh, Bloomsbury Theater, but it was it was kind of a mixture of that sort of Bloomsbury Theater type size venues and yeah. clubs where people are packed in like sardines and right up in your face and the really noisy gigs, which were my favorite. I think those were the ones that John liked the most too. Yeah. They're just the most fun. And where, and where they all, all uh, really attended well? Most of the time, but every once in a while we'd find ourselves somewhere in a town that I had never heard of. And you, you, it wouldn't be as full as, as normal yeah. occasionally. But no, I, overall, it was the reception was pretty good, and I mean, certainly good enough that we thought it was worth continuing. And, and how did you do the? Because um, obviously Neil and John were putting it together. How did you do the promo then? We didn't really no, promotion didn't. back then was basically Neil doing interviews. We didn't do any our like a promotional thing. Mm. Yeah, we didn't <clears throat> do anything like that. Um, is is basically Neil getting on and doing all these radio interviews and newspaper interviews for all the different cities that we were going to. Yeah. That sort of a thing. Yeah. I think, you know, and John did some too. John got interviewed. But yeah, we didn't really have any sort of promotional things as a like as a band. It was Neil and John. Okay. I came along at the back end of, of all that. It was a matter of obviously you had a manager then. And uh, it was a matter of trying to uh, sort of promote it anew. Because I, I had an ex- experience the earlier days, and it was all down to you know the, probably the manager side of it, you know, pushing out a promotion of some kind. And I think the hardest thing is getting people to know about it. If they knew about it, they'd come to it. I think. Yeah. Well, around two thousand three, two thousand four, when we we had um, Jim Driver, when we got. Jim Driver involved. He did. He did a lot. He was really good at doing promotion for his gigs, and he had kind of a circuit of gigs that he did with various bands. So, um, when we started doing gigs for him, we started getting a lot. You know, I think a lot better, fuller audiences at some of these places. And he he knew how to promote them, hmm. and he knew how to get Neil on the radio and do things to help with the promotion. So that did make a big difference. Yeah, um, yeah. It was quite a different story. Everything was quite different by the time you got in the band. Like you said, we had uh, we had a manager. Mm-hmm. We had we had a crew, a two person crew, but we had a crew, which made a heck of a lot of difference. And it, having the same front of house guy and the same backline guy going around with us from gig to gig was amazing it was amazing luxury really yeah. before that it was, it was whoever was there at the venue it didn't know didn't know the ruddle songs at all didn't know anything about us they had to mix it on the fly not knowing not, not having an idea that you know there's a guitar solo here or there's the the trumpet solo in double back alley here and we we would just do our best to write notes on the uh, on the set list and say you know Okay, this is the microphone Neil's going to be on for this song or that song. It's, that's the best we could do. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to say what mm. the gigs really sounded like. We always heard they were fine, but mm. it was it must have been a lot a lot better yeah. when we started touring again and we had a, 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 a crew guys going around with us that knew the songs. That was end of part one with my good friend Ken Thornton, the Ruttles guitarist. We'll hear more from him very, very soon. Look out for part two on The Ruddles Are Here. Bye for now, folks.